Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Every part of comics and artwork is a form of communication with other people. It's not just a, here, let me direct my thoughts at you as a dictation of concept, but it's hoping to convince you of how cool you think a visual could be or a story could be. And you're trying to communicate ideas and in one part storytelling and greater part just graphic impact. You're hoping to relate a sense of energy, urgency, and enthusiasm to people that there's a lightning of spirit that comes out of superheroes that has always worked for me. That it isn't really about the practicality of what they might do about, it's not the practicality about grown men punching each other in costumes. It really isn't about that. It's a visual metaphor. And that metaphor could be for a lot of things, but it's mostly just about the energy and enthusiasm that can be found in the fun of life. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. I'm happy to welcome Nikki Wheeler Nicholson back to the program. Good to see you, Nikki. Nice to see you, too. I love your opening graphics. Thank you. <laughs> They're great. You know, I've upped my game. I've, I, You know, really, Nikki's been on the show before, but it's the first time doing video. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to you, Nikki. I saw the, uh, I saw the ad for your ComicPlex uh, panel. That you're doing? Am I saying comics plex uh, properly? I guess. <laughs> All right, there you go. But uh, here's the uh, here's the ad. Uh, it's going to be on uh, on Thursday, right at uh, eight p.m. Uh, Eastern. Wednesday. Wednesday. Oh, excuse me. Wednesday. Pardon me, buddy. So, and it's look at that lineup: Nikki Wheeler Nicholson, Colleen Dorn, uh, Trina Robbins, Kim Munson, uh, Marina uh, Marie Naomi. Marie Naomi. Marie Naomi. Mari Mari Naomi. Naomi. Mari Naomi, pardon me. What is her deal? I'm looking at the uh, ad right there. I can't read that. <laughs> I did what I'm strong. So you'll tell me about the other panelists and stuff. So we certainly know we certainly know yourself and uh, and Trina and Colleen. But tell yeah. me about the other half of the panel. Okay, so um, we got the idea to do this because it's Lily Renee's 100th birthday. Um, we wanted to do a. a a panel on women in comics and because it is Lily's uh, 100th birthday we decided to do it then. So David Armstrong um, co-produced uh, the documentary on Lily that came out, uh, last year I think it was or year before. Okay. And, and um, so he has a long background in comics and in film. He's been a producer, a director in film for a long time, but he also uh, is a very well uh, uh, comics historian. Uh, I can't remember the name of the, the group. There was a, a comic collectors group for a long time and David was president of it and he knows everybody um whenever i'm with him in san diego and we walk down the hallway it, it, he knows everybody and he helped me with my book um uh, comics before superman he curated all the artwork so oh wow yeah so that was a big part of it um so yeah so i'm thrilled he's going to be on because he really knows his his early comics in particular and Mari, uh, the reason I wanted her on, because we're talking about the past, and I think it's really important for people to get the sense of flow that comes from the past that 
that creators from the past are not just back there somewhere, but that, you know, it flows through to the younger artist. And uh, Mari started drawing comics in 1997 and she's, um, she's mixed race. She's Japanese American. And uh, one of her first comics was about the whole discovery of the Japanese, um, her ancestry, her mom was Japanese and she went to Japan. So one of her first comics was about that whole experience. So she's really interesting and I'm, I'm thrilled she's going to be on because it'll be a nice, take rather than all of us old people <laughs> to have somebody young who's working sure. so and that's cool uh, yeah. is she being is she being pardon me is she being exposed for the first time to some of this golden age stuff or has she always been a um, fan of these of these creators i think maybe so and that i kind of wanted that to get sure her reaction to see what she thought about it she's um she really loves mary fleener's work and uh, so she'll talk a little bit about Mary Fleener. And again, that's that flow through, you know, from, uh, you know, from the past to women who are, who have had a long career and are still working. And then Mari as a younger person. So that's uh, awesome. Yeah, I think it'll be, it'll be a lively group. I've done panel. I've had her on panels before and she's terrific. So it'll be fun. That's cool. Well, for the for the audience, both listening and viewing audience, um, let's let's start with uh, Lily Renee and uh, tell us about uh, a little bit of her background. I'm assuming, obviously, that's a uh, that's one of her drawings. Fantastic drawing. Uh, yeah, um, Lily Renee uh, was in Austria in Nazi occupied Austria, and she wow. escaped. And her story is really phenomenal. Um, uh, Trina wrote a book about her called Lily Renee. Um, it's a graphic novel and it came out a couple of years ago. And then, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce Adrian's last name. Adrian Rubin, uh, was the director of the documentary and, uh, she and David worked together to uh, get this documentary out. And the whole story of Lily, uh, as a, a young girl, uh, escaping from, from Nazi Austria to England and then finally to the United States. And it's a pretty harrowing tale. Um, and, and they'll talk about that on Wednesday night. Um, and, and then she became a cartoonist. Um, and uh, Nick Cardi, whose work I absolutely love. I have, I have a collection of his interiors and covers that I yeah. think uh, Van, Vanguard made years ago. I love that book. Yeah, I really like him a lot. Oh, my God, yeah. Uh, so he created Senorita Rio. And then Lily took it over and she put her own spin on it, of course. And she did it for a long time. I think it was Fiction House published it. Um, and so it, it, Senorita Rio is a really great character. Uh, so I think people are going to enjoy hearing about it. And uh, we'll have some slides. Uh, you know, we can't do too much because we're, on cameras and people don't want to just see slides, but sure. um, we're, we're going to have some slides so people will get a chance to see some of the, um, the comics and what they look like, that kind of thing. And that's hopefully great. You're yeah. interested in seeing the full documentary. Absolutely. No, that's fantastic. I certainly hope so. And it's great um, to go to the event uh, that's coming on Wednesday. All you have to do is register. It's free at, as it says, women in comics, dot comicsplex.com and uh no honestly you know nikki i've seen your presentations at san diego and the like before and it's always great to have uh people like trina on and certainly colleen is a great example of that and i don't know kim so tell me about kim munson's background kim i just love um she's a friend um kim i refer to kim as my art guru because her background is art history and um she's amazing uh she's a an incredible comics aficionado fan and uh she just came out with a book called um i have to 
check my cheat sheet. All good, buddy. Uh, please. <laughs> uh, comic art in museums, and oh. it's published by um, uh, Mississippi Press. And uh, I did an interview with her on the book, and it's a really terrific book. It's a series of essays uh, by some different people, some by Kim, and she edited the whole thing. And it it it's fascinating really fascinating. I learned a lot that I had no idea about. Um, and she's got a whole section on, um, uh, uh, gosh, I'm going to have a moment <laughs> where I can't think of anything, uh, on, um, uh, uh, Beetle Bailey, um, oh, Mort uh, Walker, M Mort Walker. Thank you. <laughs> sure, buddy. Yeah. Uh, um, Brian Walker, uh, more son. Son, has a, a terrific uh, essay in there about how they started the whole museum that they started in Connecticut. Really interesting, really fascinating. Um, so it's a great book. And she's going to talk about a woman that I had never heard of. And I don't know that much about her. Uh, she was an illustrator and her name is Jessie Gillespie Willing. Okay. And, um, she, uh, uh, Willing, uh, curated a 1942, uh, comics in art show. So that's really wow. early. Yeah. So that's going to be interesting to hear what Kim has to say about that. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, Colleen is going to talk about a woman again that I didn't really know, um, who is a big influence on her and a really early, early illustrator named Rose O'Neill. And she was the one who created the Cupid. Um, and I think it was 1909. Wow. And at one point was one of the highest paid women artists in America. Wow. And she was the first American woman illustrator to be published. I think it was 1896 or something. Jesus. So, wow. Yeah. So Colleen, she's a uh, Colleen uh, really uh, has been influenced by her. And so Colleen's going to talk about her and um, how that influenced her work. And that'll be interesting because Colleen's work is so stunning. Really. No yeah. That's, yeah. No, I'm, I'm for decades. I'm a massive fan. Uh, yeah. And that's great. Now I've, I know the name Mary Fleener, what, you know, and again, I don't want to take away for obviously from the, no, uh, no, the Mary, tell us about her. I'm hoping that what, uh, that once we do this, I'd like to do a whole series of these um, because <laughs> women in comics is a pretty big subject. <laughs> um, and what I'd love to do uh, at, at some point is uh, one with the whole underground uh, women that participated, particularly out of San Francisco, like um, Trina, of course, and... Um, Lee Mars and um, Mary Fleener, Carol Tyler, a uh, great group of women. Um, and it'd be really fun to get all of them together. Okay. Mary's artwork is psychedelic. <laughs> sure, all the time. Yeah. Uh, and just really, it just pow. <laughs> it's out there. Is, is Mary still alive? Or, or yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, oh, that's she's fantastic. Very cool Good. person. And uh, uh, she lives in San Diego. Um, and uh, her, her artwork is is fabulous. I met her for the first time when I did uh, I did an interview for Women's E! News back, I don't know, uh, about 10 years ago or something. Uh, and she and uh, Ramona... Uh, and and uh, Trina were all doing a panel on Wonder Woman, and I interviewed them, and that's how I got to know Mary and her work, which is really terrific. That's so, awesome. Was yeah. that? I might have. Well, I don't know actually. I I think I saw the last panel I saw with you was a couple years ago. It was at San Diego, and it was I think about because uh, you also did a book about women creators of, of the 40s before, right? Didn't you participate in that? Uh, yeah, I did that, that was Trina's book, and and I participated in that panel. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
and Ramona was on that panel. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And I want to say, oh God, uh, Comics Buyers Guide, right? Um, great, great uh, woman that was in part of fan. Maybe it wasn't Jack. Maybe it was Jackie Estrada, but I'm thinking it was somebody else that mm. was uh, another one of those like great uh, comic fans that did fanzines back in the time and stuff. And then, but I could be wrong. I, I, I don't remember. <laughs> don't worry. And I know you do, you do a ton of panels and stuff. Uh, and I'm glad that you, I don't know how many online panels have you done in the last year? Uh, just a few. I haven't really done that much because as you know, I had a hurricane. I know buddy. So, I know. Uh, literally tore up her house. Everybody. It was so sad. I mean, I'm, yeah. you look good and I'm glad that, you know, Hopefully um, most of the bad stuff is behind you, but I can only imagine. Yeah. So um, it's been kind of difficult for me to do too much. And um, I'm just now getting back into doing more. And so this is, this is a wonderful way to begin. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm really excited for you. And honestly, I mean, I, I know you, you run great panels and again, I keep, this has been a, a regular refrain on the show in the last couple of months just because of the subjects I've been hitting, but pre 1990, really there are, there are, I run are surprisingly still gaps in history. And, and I think especially in pop culture and we need people like yourself and the other historians to fill in the blanks. And especially uh, at this time when I do believe that uh, there's a new injection of women in comics, again, maybe that's just my perception, but it seems like, there are a lot of young women that are excited to, yeah. to start doing it now. And it's great to yeah. see that there is this past that they may not be aware of. Yeah. That is really important to me <laughs> because I want to make sure that the whole younger group that's coming up, that they know their history, not just about women, but you know, as you know, my passion, of course, is the majors early comics. And I want to make sure people know those comics. I've been doing this really crazy deep in the weeds thing, um, you know, with the whole COVID thing, uh, the the new fun reprint got kind of lost in the shuffle and didn't get a lot of attention. No, and yeah. I got pretty bummed out about it and was feeling very sorry for myself. And fun, you know, especially after I went through the whole hurricane thing. And um, in November, I kind of kicked myself in the butt and said, okay, you need to get your act together here. So what I did is I started with new fun number one and I went through it page by page. And then I wrote up a piece about it. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to go through the whole thing. <laughs> so I got through all of 1935. Um, so I went through New Fun 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay. And, and then I got, uh, I did the big book of comics that came out in between. And now I'm on 1936. And I'm going to go through the whole thing. Hopefully I'll get that done this year because I'm okay. keeping with the 85 year thing. And then next year I'll do 1937. So it's been really interesting because I'm seeing things that I didn't see before going through it chronologically and and reading each of the comics and then getting the next installment, it's fascinating. I'm sure. It's really, really fascinating. And of course, you know, I'm a total crazy person <laughs> about this. <laughs> so I really, I so. really want people to uh, know about the, the, just the incredible creativity that was there at the beginning. For instance, Sheldon Mayer's comics, I didn't really know his comics, but they are hilarious. I mean, they're perfectly, you could uh, show them today and they'd be just as funny and just as smart. And the, the artwork, of course, is very different from what we see today. But otherwise, the stories are terrific. 
That's and, great. Yeah, and they really can, you really want to know what's going to happen next. And isn't that the whole point? A hundred percent, absolutely. And again, uh, ironic because I'm prepping. We're not going to do it for a few months, but a couple friends and I are going to go back and look at um, kinescopes that are still on YouTube of the golden age of television. And I've also been to do proper background research. I've been reading and, and watching a ton of interviews with a lot of these writers, directors, and performers that were doing it back then. And Arthur Penn, the fantastic director, was oh, talking wow. about his his early TV days, you yeah. know, 10, 10 years before he did Bonnie and Clyde and things like that. I mean, really, actually, more like 20 years before, starting in the 40s. And it's like we were inventing the language of television. And I can appreciate that with the majors comics yeah. and stuff. He he and and those original writers and editors were literally creating the language of comic books and uh, the serialization that we got in the day-to-day -day newspaper strips, but yeah. to do it in this new format, and this was all brand new. And I love the fact that this is literally years before Action Comics number one and Superman. Yeah. And this is yeah. this, I mean, there really was this large body of work, as we know. Uh, Batman debuting the next year in 39 is in Detective 27. And obviously Detective Comics even predates action and everything. So, you know, no, I think I think it's terrific that you're doing this. And yes, yeah, so was uh, was Shelley's series, was it was it a comedy? Was it a like a domestic they're, comedy? They're, they're very funny. Uh, one is called The uh, Amazing Adventures of Mr. Weed. And um, uh it's this whole thing where they time travel and it's, it's really terrific. It That's just, cool. Um, I, I've been posting, I doubt anybody reads them, but they're out there. If anybody's interested on your Facebook page, where are you posting stuff? Um, I'm posting it on the majors, uh, uh, website on the blog. Give and, us the, give us the URL and I'll post it here. Okay. It's, uh, it's long. Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson dot com. I'm doing it as we're speaking, so that's awesome. Uh, yeah. and I'm looking at your spelling to make sure I do it right. Uh, Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson dot com. Let's see, am I doing it right? Right. That's yeah. awesome. Do, do you have? I mean, I don't even know. Are these books in? Are they are they in public domain? Are they the property of DC because they're well, the precursor? You know. Sure. <laughs> no, that's a fair answer. And yeah. uh, is that in process of in, being discovered? They're in public domain up to a point, and uh, you know it's always tricky dealing with DC. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Oh, no, I totally understand. Um, I uh, yeah, and also, I mean, well, that's why I was wondering if any of the majors' concepts that you could, you know, maybe assign them to new writers and artists and come up with new well, stories. Interesting, you should bring that up because the comic I'm going to talk about on Wednesday is Sandra of the Secret Service, and Sandra of the Secret Service was on with had prime real estate she was the first comic in new fun number one you open the page and there she was so that tells you right there the major thought that was really important and um she was originally drawn by charles flanders and some people have attributed the character to him but charles flanders never created a character. I think he did um, maybe an original Robin Hood. I'm not sure, but he was mostly an illustrator. He didn't really create characters. And then it was later taken over by um, uh, William Clarence Brigham Jr. Okay. Who for a long time, but he didn't create it either. And the major did a lot of the scripts and I'm pretty sure he created the character because I know his pulps really well. And the character is just classic of one of his heroines from the pulps. And, you know, my great grandmother, his mother was a suffragette. So, oh, wow. Yeah, that's why we have the hyphenated last name. 
Wheeler Dash. Network. Oh, that's great. I had no idea. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. You know who told me that? <laughs> David Saunders told me that wow. <laughs> years ago. Um, we were talking about something. He said, well, you know why your last name's hyphenated? And I said, I thought it was just because my family's pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound good at the country club. You got to admit, that's pretty good. And he said, no, <laughs> you know, he said it's the suffragette thing. Well, that's even cooler. So that yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm yeah. bringing up a, I'm yeah. bringing up a new fun uh, cover. I, I hope this is number one. Um, I'll tell you in a second. Oh, there it is. Wait a minute. Stand by. Okay, here it comes. Um, <laughs> and I love this because um, I know I have a print of a different new fun cover, but I love that. You couldn't wait that literally the comics would begin right there on the cover. Yeah. Oh, that's number three. Okay. And, okay. That's, that is hilarious. That comic right there. That is um, uh, Clemens Gratter and the writer was Ken Fitch. And it is the most ridiculous sci-fi thing. you can, I mean, look at that, that monster, right? <laughs> I mean, is that hilarious or yes. what? And no, at what? First, I thought it was kind of goofy as I started reading it, but the more I read more of as it went along, they did it totally tongue in cheek. I'm sure of it. I'm absolutely sure of it because Ken Fitch was an excellent, excellent writer. He did, he wrote a lot of pulps. He was in comics for a long time. He had a long career, really interesting guy too. So, you know, when I did the, um, bios for uh, New Fun number one. There's a little bit about each of those guys. Um, it's not huge. I had to beg for that. And uh, so it's not, you know, it's not, it, they're just short little bios, but I insisted that there had to be bios of everybody yeah. who created. Um, so, yeah. So I won that battle. <laughs> That's cool. Is yeah. is the is the cover with Jack Woods on the cover? Is that number one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I I saw that image, and I'll I'll pull I'll pull that up in a second. Oh, there you go, buddy. Stand by. Let me do that. Wow, man. Yeah. You know that's that's you know I I used to buy all those uh, famous first edition reprints when they were coming out, and sadly I missed out on the on the uh, new fun one. That's amazing. Um, uh, I have some. <laughs> You can buy them on my on on the major's website. Good to know. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. that's excellent. Well, that's the thing, honestly. So you know, was uh, you know, Vince Sullivan? I know is an important editor that was very important to the Superman. Uh, not creation because that was Siegel and Schuster, but in terms of fostering it through action and D and national back then. And yeah. you know, did, did he he collaborated with uh, with your grandfather? Didn't he? He, uh, he, he, and uh, uh, Whitney Ellsworth were hired pretty quickly after it started, and um, they, uh, uh, Vin Sullivan, um, did a lot of the covers, and uh, at one point he was assistant editor, uh, and uh, so he he was very instrumental in 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 the comics, in those early comics, very much so. Um, at the end, uh, this isn't something that I've talked a lot about, uh, but at the very end during the bankruptcy proceedings, you know, the forced bankruptcy. Right. The major for people who haven't heard our first discussion or also read your book, that's how, unfortunately, the major had to give up his intellectual properties, right? You, you, you tell the story better than I do, Nikki, please. Um, well, it, you know, yesterday I was thinking about this and I thought, you know, if this were happening today, it would be called a hostile takeover <laughs> because it was hostile and they took it over. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, during the bankruptcy trial, there's a lot of really interesting information in there. And one of the things the major said uh, you know, when he was being questioned is the the lawyers were trying to get him the 
lawyers for Don and Feldon Leibowitz were trying to get him to say that Vin Sullivan and Whitney Ellsworth uh, had done these covers as work for hire. And the major said, no, <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> they were, uh, they were the artist and that was different. You know, that was a creation and they should be paid as the artist, as the creators. So he put his foot down with that, which meant that he owed them more money that he owed them. But, you know, he, he was a, he believed in doing things the right way. So obviously Ben Sullivan and Whitney Ellsworth had, um, uh, were very involved um, pretty early on. That's amazing. And, you know, for people who have sharp eyes and pay attention to the Adventures of Superman television show credits, you'll see mm -hmm. the name Whitney Ellsworth. And if you don't know, as Nikki was saying, he was really one of the top editors. He was the Superman editor. And in fact, when they decided to make the, the television show in the early 50s, he just kind of graduated up and became, you know, the, if not the, the well, certainly the liaison, but a much more active role in the productions and stuff. And it's kind of cool. And also, I always love, and it's, you know, thank God most of them don't run some voiceover during the end credits of the adventures of Superman. But you always hear that voice saying Superman appears every month in action and, uh, and Superman <laughs> comics. And it's like, yeah, because uh, they, they produced the television show they made. That's how big national was at that moment that they could make their own television show. Yeah. And that's, that's cool. But I also can appreciate that again, sadly, some of these uh, people, are also responsible for really kind of running your uncle or your grandfather out of the business, which kind of sucks because yeah. he was such a uh, believer on the creative side. And, 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 and obviously, as you point out with Whitney and, and Vin, you know, was a defender of creator rights. And isn't it sad? The more things change, the more they stay the same. I mean, this literally has been going on since the very beginning of comics in terms of rights and uh, lousy deals and uh, people taking advantage. And certainly Donna Feldon Leibowitz, uh, yeah, you know. a lot of people who don't know the history really well assume that my grandfather was part of the, you know, uh, uh, takeover of Siegel and Schuster. And that's not true at all. No. Um, what happened with what people don't know is that in December 1937, when everything went down with Siegel and Schuster, that's when everything went down with my grandfather, too. So he was all part of that, you know, desire to take things over. Wow. And um, he wrote a letter. I, I think I talk about it in DC Comics before Superman. He wrote a letter to Jerry Siegel talking about his rights, saying, uh, you know, you, you own the rights, you know, we'll return it to you whenever you want. Wow. Uh, yeah. So... You know, he was very clear about that. He was going by the old school uh, pulp uh, uh, contracts. Yes. For first North American serial rights. So once it was published in North America as, you know, serial, then the rights reverted back to the person, the creator. Yep. So he, he was going by that. And, um, you know, that was part of the problem. <laughs> no, I understand. And, you know, um, I got to talk a few times with Dennis Kitchen over the years. And yeah. it was great to hear that he had that same philosophy about yeah. a lot of the underground comics. And it's yeah. like, yeah, we'll, we'll take the publisher rights for the first year or two or whatever. But ultimately, the rights will revert back to you creators and do what you want with that stuff. So it would be fun to hear, you know, people like Mary and, and Trina maybe talk about that era and you know, in comparison and stuff. And again, it's like, it is crazy. I, uh, you know, I, I sympathize and I hope that uh, again, with, with the, the stories, at least that are in the public domain, I hope you're able to do something fun with them as far as. I, I was going to tell you, and I got sidetracked. All good, um, buddy. This is all uh, interesting. You know that. Um, Sandra of the secret service, Lee Mars and I are doing a new comic of Sandra. That's terrific. Yeah, and it's called uh, Sandra of the Secret Service and the Cuban Affair. 
And uh, I based it on a real incident. Um, in in the late 30s, mid 30s, um, Meyer Lansky, the gangster who uh, ran the casinos down in Cuba, yep. he helped the US Navy, I think it was, uh, with the spying on the the German U-boats that were in the Gulf of Mexico at the time. Sure. So he he was helping the Navy. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. So I wrote a script and uh, Lee is doing the artwork. And through a mutual friend, I uh, I got connected with Meyer Lansky's granddaughter. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, and she's just very, she's thrilled. She thinks it's just great that we're doing this. I understand. I understand. The Capone yeah. and uh, descendants had a reality show. I never saw it, but that yeah. just blew my mind. And I can appreciate that on a, a historic level that, you know, infamous is still famous. And, and, you know, you're, you're, your your great great grandfather in the case of the Capones, you know, made an impact, and I'm sure with Lansky's uh, granddaughter. If people don't know about Meyer Lansky, think if you know Godfather Two, uh, the character that uh, Lee Strasberg plays, and why am I blanking? The old man. Uh, this is the business we've chosen. Is yeah, essentially yeah. Meyer Lansky and stuff. And I always love those stories about the mob, uh, both during the 30s and certainly during World War Two. That as much as they were crooks, they were also patriots. So yeah. they really did get involved in a lot of like, you know, kind of uh, underhanded stuff in, yeah. in, in trying to help the government, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I just thought it was a, a, just a wonderful story. Also, because of my grandfather's connection to Cuba, because, you know, the famous Cuba trip. And um, so I also added in to uh, the story, one of my grandfather's uh, alter egos uh, from the Pulps, he had a character that he used, uh, I think about 15 times at least, called Major Davies. And okay. so Major Davies is Sandra's counterpoint, her male. Uh, oh, fun. Yeah. 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 So I, I gave him a, a, a a promotion. He's Colonel Davies. <laughs> I thought he deserved a promotion. <laughs> well, that's nice. Exactly. I think that's that's very yeah. kind of you. I know. <laughs> that's great. That's really exciting. Are you going to are you going to kickstart it? Are you going to go fund me it in any way? What, um, what are your publishing well, plans? David Lloyd. God, love that man. I love David. Go on. <laughs> Uh, he's uh, publishing it initially in Aces Weekly, so it's going to be uh, out in July. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, Nikki, you got to come back when it's on Aces yeah. Weekly. Lee and I are having so much fun. And it's just great. I'm really excited about it. And we've got a couple of other stories that we're already working on as follow up. So, yeah. Brilliant. Outstanding. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear that. And, and that's terrific that you're doing it with David. Um, I'm yeah. trying to remember the last time I talked to David. It might have been 2019. But I've certainly discussed, uh, at, you know, um, Aces Weekly, and 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 the variety of comics that he provides there he are just so great. Fabulous! I told David that he has that same entrepreneurial spirit that my grandfather had. Really, a great visionary, a creator himself, and uh, I, I just think he's he's just wonderful. So, I'm with you, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. For people who don't know, this was Nikki's book. Uh, DC Comics before Superman. So, uh, you know, definitely check that out because, again, it gives you the background. It was, Nikki, and forgive me if I'm misremembering, it was That's a combination a of both the comics and uh, the Major's uh, biography that you worked on, or are yeah. those two separate books? Yeah. No, um, I, I'm working on a full biography, uh, which I've had a little bit of trouble with because I don't really want to do an academic biography. I'm a writer myself and I, I can do the academic thing, but I, I just, it just doesn't interest me. So I had to figure out a way to make it a little bit more creative. So I, I've used some incidents that as I've gone through this process and 
found out things about my grandfather, it's affected my life. Um, I, I'm the only child of my mother and my father. And he had a second family with five children and she had a second family with three children. So I've had a weird kind of um, background and it's my grandfather's life has been um, a touchstone for me in a lot of ways because I really identify with his creative spirit. And I also identify with the injustice that occurred in his life. And for a long time, I couldn't figure out why I was so passionate about that. But then I realized it because it, 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 it touches something in me. So, you know, it's a personal thing for me because of what happened to him filtered down to what happened to me in my life. And um, so I, I feel very strongly about it. And that's how I'm weaving in some of the way I discovered things about him and my own adventures. I've been to Cuba. I've been to Paris. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I've been to London. I've I've gone to a lot of the places where he was, and so I've had a lot of adventures. And uh, so uh, it's that's coming together. But DC Comics before Superman, I did a shorter version of his biography. So there's a good through line there for people who want to who don't really know about him. It's a good way to get started. And you can also get that on the website. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, uh, let's put that up again once once again. Absolutely. So there you go, everybody. Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson dot com. That's where to, where you go uh, to uh, to purchase some of the stuff from Nikki, and uh, and that's great. And also, no, I understand. And and again, this is a guy that easily could have um, uh, been mis you know overlooked, and I think is in a lot of ways. I mean, I know in older. Um, maybe Jules Pfeiffer, I don't even remember the, his, the comic historians, that at least mentioned the major. But it really is such a brief footnote, and it really took like your efforts to really flesh out the story. And in comparison, and he, I think he did more, but much like Ian Fleming having real uh, intelligence and spy adventures during World War II, the major was literally this like kind of guy who... I, I say this in the best way. I don't mean this in a negative way because I think the phrase has become kind of negative and sometimes it, it, it's justified, but a, like a mercenary or a soldier of fortune? Um, How no, would you describe was, the major? He was actually in the army. Well, that's um, true too, of course. Yes. Yeah. So he was actually in the army, but he was in uh, intelligence work. Um, and um, so a lot of the pulp stories he wrote that then became comics. That's why I did it as a, you know, based on the, that concept of the pulps and how they became comics. And he had a lot of those adventures that he based those stories on. So, um, yeah, he had a very adventuresome life. Oh, God. Well, and we talked about, uh, you know, again, people might know the song, the Bob Marley song, Buffalo Soldiers. And the major wasn't he in charge of the uh, Buffalo Soldier Regiment? Uh, he had he was in charge of Troop K uh, for the Ninth Cavalry in uh, 1915, wow. and he took a group of those soldiers to the Philippines. And uh, he, you know, this is 1915, so we're talking, you know, the whole racial attitudes of that period. And he saw very quickly how these men were treated and he didn't like it. And so he challenged his superior officer to a contest between the white guys and these black guys, his troops. And he told his superior officer, I can get these guys up to speed. Um, and we're going to, you know, we're going to have a contest. So all the big brass came and it was this huge big deal. And he did. His guys beat the pants off of these other guys. And what they were doing is um, they were uh, a machine gun troop. And what yeah. they would 
to do is they would run at a gallop and jump off their horses and set up the machine gun in a matter of seconds. And they beat the world's record. It was in all these books and it was in the newspapers. And needless to say, the superior officer wasn't too fond of him after that. But he, he believed very strongly uh, that the army should be integrated. He did not believe in segregation. And this wow. is 1915. Where it didn't happen until Truman in 1948. So yeah. it took that long for them to really fully integrate the uh, the army and stuff. No, it's uh, honestly, that's, that's amazing. And um, again, I just, having read your book and everything, I really got to, you know, see some of those first comics. And yeah, that through line from the Pulps, everyone, everyone at least is aware of the basics of it and the mm -hmm. precursors of the superheroes in the shadow and, you know, some of the other great uh, uh, heroes, the pulp heroes and stuff. And that's why I love reading those first initial comics because yeah. along with Superman, you know, you had uh, Slam Bradley, of course, the, the other Siegel and Schuster creation uh, that thankfully I'm, I'm glad when DC kind of brings him back and then dips into that history or Dr. Occult, a very interesting, almost a Dr. Dr. Occult. So do I, and kind of a precursor to Dr. Strange in Marvel by several decades. And it's like, no, these are, these are really the building blocks. And I, I, at the same time, I would not like to see your ability to tell new stories killed by that. But I do, I, as a reader, appreciated when the DC Universe would kind of acknowledge these guys. In fact, uh, last year I was talking to Matt Wagner and how Matt Wagner really, especially in that uh, Sandman Mystery Theater, but even other comics that he's done at Vertigo, uh, dipped into the DC Universe. And I'm like, how'd you get permission for that? He goes, well, I just did it. I didn't ask. The, the the art was done. The characters are there. There wasn't much they could do about it, but just go, all right. And, you know, no, but Dr. Occult and, and uh, these, these original DC heroes are just kind of roaming around the 30s along with Wesley Dodds, the Golden Age Sandman. And it's like, no, that's cool. It's like, what happened before? Even from a fictional standpoint, what happened in the DC universe before the, the yeah. rocket lands on Earth? And then and the Kryptonian is here. <laughs> yeah. Um, Slam Bradley was created by my grandfather. Oh, forgive me. Wow. Yeah. Shame on me. Oh, shit. Well, then I'm sorry, Nikki. What the no, hell? No, that's okay. A lot of people don't know. Um, they finally, uh, the DC lawyers finally uh, updated the um, the Wikipedia uh, page on Slam okay. Bradley. Uh, my grandfather came up with the idea, created the character, and then he turned it over to Jerry and Joe. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. And they then, uh, drew, you know, drew it and wrote the stories. And, um, yeah, so it was his idea. And I always love to show, by the way, Joe Schuster's art in those early comics. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I just want to cry. It's so... Just, uh, just I just love his artwork. I'm with and you. Almost immediately, going through chronologically with the comics, you start with you know the first um, th they appeared in the October issue of of New Fun, and uh, you see you see the progression almost immediately. Joe Schuster's art just takes off. I mean, just almost immediately. Really, really stunning, stunning work. And it took Jerry a little bit of time to kind of get his feet with the, the scripts. But, you know, he was on it pretty quickly, too. Um, so, I mean, they my grandfather knew right off the bat those guys were really talented. That's awesome. And, and you know, again, we mentioned Shelley Mayer and, and Ken Fitch, right? Am I saying, his, his, isn't that his name? One of the writers? Uh, Ken Fitch. Yes. Okay. Um, were there other uh, Golden Age writers or artists that uh, started with the major and then obviously progressed as the 30s went into the 40s? Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, artists that I really love who had this really quirky, quirky comic, uh, Tom Cooper. Okay. Uh, 
had a Captain Spinnaker. And it is the quirkiest thing you can possibly imagine. And it gets quirkier and quirkier as you go along. And I really like it a lot for that reason. Was because it like a merchant marine? What kind of adventures did uh, Captain Spinnaker have? He he's he's this explorer who has a submarine and oh, he wow. has he has this um I don't want to use the word Eskimo because that's you're Inuit, I suppose. Inuit yeah, might I, be I, the proper yeah, term. Whether he was an Inuit or not, I don't know, but he okay. was of native uh uh blood and he's the he's Captain Spinnaker's uh sidekick. And what I really love about it is there's no uh, stereotypical language junk going on. You know, he just speaks in English. So that's really nice. And he's actually the smarter of the two. Oh, and, nice. Wow. Yeah. And it's it's a very funny, funny comic. And, well, uh, you know, Nikki, it's, it's comics like that, even... And I'm glad to hear that there were no no slurs or anything like that you'd have to kind of get a little like, or at least put things in context. Because yeah. I really think foreign intrigue, and a lot of what the major was writing about was foreign intrigue, I really think there's an opportunity to tell those stories today and tell them in the proper context of, okay, we don't have the same language, but um, these natives of their, of their uh, land are certainly more knowledgeable about their surroundings yeah. than the white man that suddenly shows up. But you can still tell interesting stories. And God, I think, you know, Ram V, I don't know if you're aware of him, great Indian writer. He's based in London. And uh, and I never remember the name of his book, but he did this amazing vampire book of a British vampire going to India during the 19th century and kind of twisting the usual white white uh, god mm -hmm. coming to the foreign land and, and teaching the natives what to do. And it's like, this is a really interesting opportunity to tell foreign intrigue stories, and again, not not shirk the responsibility or uh, 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 miss the advantage and and take advantage of the chance to to write these things in a better context. Right, right, right. right. So yeah, no, I think that's great. I hope uh, we see Captain Spinnaker stories. I think that would be terrific. Well, yeah, driving I mean, come on, submarines. Love, Good lord, I love to bring those back because they are just hysterical. I mean, just. And they're they're funny. They've got all these funny little inside jokes in them. Uh, you know, for instance, one of the ships is called the Lollipop. It's a good ship. <laughs> and then the good ship. <laughs> That's great. That's and fantastic. It's a little tiny thing in the corner that maybe you wouldn't even notice. <laughs> so I love stuff like that. Oh, I'm with you absolutely. I think that that's the a creator just kind of having fun and not caring whether anybody sees it or not, but enjoying themselves. Yeah, it was, well, things were fast and loose back then. And also you figure both the writers and the artists. And again, I use this analogy of the golden age of television. And uh, one of the great writers was saying, Hey, you know, at the time television was only paying nothing. And, you know, like he said, uh, one of his one act plays was adapted for television and he got a $25 royalty because it was a script that was in Samuel French, which is where plays are in scripts yeah. are normally yeah. like, you know, that's where they're published and that's how other theaters, regional theaters can get the rights to do them and stuff. And the, you know, the, uh, the author gets, a, you know, a royalty. And, uh, and it's like nobody in, nobody in radio or on in Broadway wanted to do television because it really was, just peanuts as far as money. So who do you go to? Well, you go to the young, hungry writers and artists in the case of comics who, you know, they want to break in. They're not in the slicks. They're not Norman Rockwell in the Saturday evening post, or they're not even at the comic strip level where their stuff is being syndicated and they're making big money. So you're talking about Noel Sickles and, you know, people like, uh, and I'm blanking uh, Terry and the pirates, of course, um, well, there, there, yeah. there were some older guys who were established artists who were in some of those early comics because don't forget this was a depression so people needed money and when sure. they 
heard through this this is a small community so everybody is all in this uh you know 42nd street you know uh park avenue uh madison avenue you know right in third avenue you know everybody's like in this tight little area and you know they all drank in the same place. absolutely yeah. And uh, the art school was upstairs from the um, uh, from the subway, you know, so everybody's like, you know, they're all here and everybody's like, hey, this guy's paying a few bucks, you know. So um, so there are some older, more established artists in the early ones uh, okay. who were looking for, you know, for work. Sure. Extra money. Or, or just money, period, income, absolutely. No, yeah. I can appreciate that. Now, yeah. Have you, um, Fred Van Lenty and Ryan Dunleavy did this incredible comic book history of comics where they really do tell the story in comic book form. And as you point out that everybody really was in that same area of New York. Are you talking about, did you say Fred Van Lent? Van yeah. Lenty, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you read it? Have you read their- oh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you I, think they did? Uh, he got a few things wrong about the major, which I told him about. Okay. <laughs> and he was very nice about it. Uh, I read it. It came out a number of years ago. A couple of years. Yeah, about, yeah, yeah. maybe even longer. Yeah, I, I think they're great. Their, their graphic novels are just wonderful. Uh, I, they, I, I appreciate them a lot. They just wrapped up one about the history of animation. Oh, so wow. They did, they did the same thing, yeah, on animation and stuff. No, they're really, I mean... I, uh, Fred's amazing, and Ryan, the artist, is incredible yeah, as well. They're, and they're, they're, they're good guys. They're they're really good guys. Yeah, anything they they do is is good. I agree. I you know it's funny. I was watching this weekend. Uh, Mark Miller's Netflix series dropped uh, Jupiter's Legacy, oh, really? and it really does from a from a time period standpoint. The story starts in the late twenties, oh, and really? the 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 Superman character that Josh Dumel plays, uh, you see his early days before he gets his powers. And um, he's working for a steel company in Chicago right before the stock market crash. And I found that really interesting because there really is that pulp era that yeah, the story yeah, begins yeah. in. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's good. I, I don't know if you, if you were aware of it. No, so, I, I sort of, but I, I haven't seen it yet. Just dropped. It just dropped on Friday. So, are you watching? Are you watching any of the modern uh, superhero stuff? It's okay. You can say no. Not a whole lot. <laughs> That's fine. I, I'm not a big fan. I, I, I'm basically your PG girl. <laughs> I, I'm just not big with all the violence. I just okay. That's cool. I, I just can't deal with it. That's all right. Well, and again. You know, the major, and especially when comics began, uh, that was just one of many genres. And again, we're talking about the the comedy that Shelley Mara did and all the, I mean, God, romance, westerns, everything was in these initial comics. And that's why I love those um, reproductions yeah. of the original comics that literally even had the ads, everything. And also, um, I love, even though they're terrible, those uh, one or two page text pieces that were in comics so that um, the comic would be considered a magazine and therefore for people who wanted to subscribe uh, they could do a postage rate that right. was cheaper than right. if it was purely comics wall to wall and right. you know Cap uh, Stan Lee's first uh, published work uh, at, at Timely was one of those text pieces about Captain America I think it was in the third issue of Captain America and really I love reading Golden Age comics and even seeing them and and they're westerns or they're spy stories but or it's a fast ads, murder mystery and they're crazy. Ads are pretty funny too. What's that? The ads are. Oh God, funny. yes. And it's also you can really get a sense of the depression too because of the ads. You know what they're advertising and a lot of it is about how to get work, how to gain a new skill in order to get work. Um, so that that's interesting too. I agree, absolutely. You ever see the movie? Uh, it's from the seventies, Hearts of the West, and it's Jeff Bridges, and he answers an ad for one of those like uh, correspondence. I, yeah, yeah. 
I saw it a long time ago. That's all right. I, you know, yeah. well, you know, and I love old movies, and so I'm constantly watching Turner and, <laughs> yeah. and any and and I have like all the streamers that show old movies. I'm like right there with um, Criterion and even Amazon Prime. Thankfully, shows a lot of great old movies. But yeah. no, I love that, and I love how yeah, for people uh, listening or watching, in Hearts of the West, it's a great story, and and he starts off and he wants to be a pulp writer, but uh, finds out that the school is kind of BS. And he wanders into this uh, area where they're making uh, 1930s uh, westerns, and he just becomes a uh, writer and an actor in these in these westerns and stuff. And it's just terrific. It really does kind of capture, I think, yeah, the creativity of the actor. moment. He's such a oh, good actor, absolutely. And Andy Griffith is really great in it too, and kind of an older cow cowboy actor and stuff. And no, I think I think it's a really great little movie. Um, and I, and again, I think I'll make him watch it. <laughs> what's that? I'm gonna to have to go back and watch it again. Yeah, no, it's worth it. It absolutely is worth it, definitely. So, and also, God, I love the Robert Howard movie, uh, The Whole Wide World. It's Renee Zellweger and um, oh God, Vincent Vincent D'Onofrio plays Robert Howard. And again, I mean, I, Howard was a very different person, right. but he and the major obviously kind of uh, wrote in the same genres and everything of the day. Right. Right. So. Yeah, there were a lot of amazing pulp writers um, that uh, you know that a lot of people have no idea about. And uh, I mean, can you imagine as a writer for me thinking about? I, I love the pulps, and me too. Uh, thinking about get being able to make a living writing, you know, is just that's great. <laughs> and yeah. There, thousands of magazines i mean just thousands of them and if you were a good writer and you wrote pretty quickly uh you could make a decent living my grandfather did he got his family to europe uh on his pulp earnings before wow. before the uh stock market crash so um pumpkin time wants to know about uh, pulp titles he was born in 1994 he doesn't know any and it's funny, he says, aside from Flash Gordon, technically Flash Gordon was really a comic strip. It wasn't a pulp. I don't believe they made – and maybe they maybe they did. Maybe King Features also did uh, pro stories, or maybe – and certainly they did big little books of the day. But when we say pulp heroes, we're talking about uh, characters like Doc Savage, The Shadow. Uh, I'll let I'll let Nikki rattle off a couple of her favorites. Um. Well – those are the most well known, but you really have to look at some of the writers uh, to to know more. And uh, my grandfather was not as prolific as a lot of people. Some of the pulp writers wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Uh, um, there's a uh, there are reprints of a lot of those pulps, and um, there are a couple of. Uh, 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 William Patrick Murray, uh, he has a lot of reprints that he's that he has done of different writers. Ed Hulse has done a lot of the reprints of the westerns and is very knowledgeable about that. Um, uh, Rich uh, uh, Harvey uh, has uh, a site with a lot of reprints of pulps, and he also puts out. Uh, a magazine too um, that you can find uh, online. Um, uh, I can't think of the name of anything right now. No, that's great though, and I mean, it really, that's a great Google place to start in terms of those things. And yeah, Will Murray, I think, is a great uh, custodian of the history of the pulps, and yeah. also yeah. has written uh, modern stories about some of these pulp characters. Yes. So no, I, honestly, man, and really, uh, you know, Google is your friend. I mean, really, look up. Uh, on on Google, look for Pulp Pulp uh, Magazine Heroes, if and he, you'll find dozens. If he's on Facebook, uh, it, tell him to uh, um, you know to to message me, and I'll I'll send him in the right direction for uh, you know to pick up some pulp titles. That's great. That's excellent. No, yeah. I, I again, I mean, you know, um, detective char characters, everything that. Uh, that uh you know the pulps represented much like comics and stuff there are a lot of great heroes to follow and and men and women uh i know candy mason is a is a mm -hmm. female detective of the pulp era and stuff and actually 
had her own radio show for a short time as well. I'm a big, you see, as, as, as Nikki, I'm sure you're a, I'm guessing you might be an old time radio fan. Um, no, to, to a point. Okay. Um, I, I, I've been so focused in the last 10 years, particularly on, on pulps and comics that I really have had no chance to do much of anything. That's cool. <laughs> well, again, you know, honestly, and, and, um, I, I, uh, Again, as I said, there there are pockets of history that are just people either just don't they don't think about them or you know and, and reserve the brain space or or have the intellectual curiosity to pursue these things. But there really are in the midst of the, the pulp era that you know started got in the teens, uh I, and probably earlier than that, but uh just there are some amazing characters that were created that might be in the public domain now, and I absolutely would point to anyone to just even right. just do a Google search of some great Paul Peros. And I think there are great uh, character inspirations uh, within those. And God, you know, we mentioned uh, the captain, the uh, submarine captain and stuff. God, I, there's just something really iconic about that pre atomic age and beyond yeah. uh, period that's called diesel punk. And is that, oh, period, okay. oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. Between world war one and, and the atomic age. Yeah. And there's just such a great group of, of heroes and ideas to call. And when you think of that submarine uh, captain and stuff, God, those old deep sea diver giant helmets and the, yeah, 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 the suits yeah. they would have. I mean, that stuff just begs to be drawn in a comic book and you get yeah. a great underwater adventure or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I just think the opportunity is there. I just literally bought a, an anthology of diesel pumps, punk stories from new writers that I, I've been meaning to sit down and read. So. Yeah. One of the comics that Clem uh, Gretter and uh, uh, Ken Fitch did, besides the one that you showed, uh, Don Drake on the planet Sorrow, uh, the, the other one that's really hilarious that they did from the very beginning uh, was uh, uh, Super Police 2022. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oops. <laughs> All right, it might be 2023. I can't remember right Hilarious. now. Hilarious. It's like right now. Absolutely. It's totally ridiculous. Well, you know, Doc the, Smith. The machines are ridiculous. The uh, Just the whole thing. It's but the, yeah, ridiculous. but that's fun. And the visuals you can create from those uh, thoughts are just, and of course, even the, obviously the cover art and the, when they did do interior illustrations and stuff. No, that stuff is great. Uh, and it reminded me, as you said that, well, like uh, Doc Smith, the great pulp writer that created the Lensmen, and everyone knows that, like, if you really know your deep history, the Green Lantern Corps was inspired by the Lensmen. These this this group of space, that. yeah, space, you know, inter intergalactic space cops, just like Space Police. And I'm sure that Space Police was a poor man's uh, uh, Lensmen because, yeah, that's what they were, and they were essentially just pulps disguised as science fiction and god i was on a, a television show years ago called prophets of science fiction and so many of the great uh, asimov stories and and other uh, sci-fi writers they really were they were just they were pulp stories with some rocket ships or whatever time yeah. travel machines but they essentially really were just straight up pulp novels you know, or detective stories with a sci-fi twist yeah yeah cool stuff absolutely well Nikki, we'll, we'll point everyone to Wednesday night and uh, what you're doing there. Again, it's at uh, ComicsPlex. So go to womeninincomics.comicsplex, uh, and that's comics with an X for the audio audience, and Plex. So it's C-O-M-I-X-P-L-E-X.com, and you'll uh, you'll see uh, Nikki's panel that's running Wednesday night starting at 8 p.m. Eastern to 9.30, and a great group of uh, people to uh, discuss – some uh, forgotten women in comics that I certainly hope uh, your awareness will improve and uh, make us want to seek out some of the great work. And again, uh, I didn't even really talk about Trina, and she's like the goddess. <laughs> oh yeah, well we love Trina, absolutely. I mean, and, you'll forgive me because yeah, she and my me for we can we can talk a minute about Trina. Trina is uh, amazing. Well, Please, besides uh, the Lily, besides Lily Renee, she's also going to talk about Tarpe Mills and Miss Fury. So Great. that'll be fun too. 
Um, and, you know, Trina is, you know, anything you want to know about women in comics, you got to have Trina. You know? No, I hear, you know, actually, uh, Nikki, and, I, and I'm sure you do it anyway, but I'll say it on the air. I've been meaning to have Trina on the show for years and I haven't. So anyway, you yeah. could uh, provide an introduction. It would be great to have her on. Stage. Yeah, no, she's fabulous. I love her to pieces. And I, I refer to her and Ramona as uh, the grand dames. So. Yeah. You know, R Ramona, how's she doing? I mean, she's in her 90s and I don't want to get personal if there's any issues. Um, but I think she's doing okay. Uh, she's done a couple of commissions for some people recently. So. That's great. Yeah. That's, man. I, uh, she, I, I, uh, at, at New York, uh, years ago, she would just have finished, you know, uh, eight by fives or whatever, even. And it was great because I know she's so well known for Aquaman. She had this wonderful Namor that she did. And I'm like, well, I gotta have that because that's great. That's like seeing a Batman artist do uh, Moon Knight or, you know, a comparable yeah. character from yeah. the other company. And, uh, also, uh, she did a lovely metamorpho for me years ago, and I did. They're they're two of my favorite pieces, and I'm so glad that I actually have yeah, some like real uh, original, you know, Trin or uh, uh, Ramona sketches and stuff. That's that's great. You know, I'm more of a I'm more of an, uh, a commission art guy where I I'd rather pay for them to draw something for me rather than purchase a page because to me that's almost like a private performance. That's like asking Springsteen to whip out the guitar and just sing a song for you, you know? And you know, that's one of the things I love about comics is that it's one of the few places left where anybody, anybody in the public, a fan, can go to a convention, walk down the aisle, and talk to a creator, an artist, and with very little money, get an original piece of art. Art. So, I totally agree. Yeah. I, 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 that's one of the things that I really love. I'm so with you. You know, uh, tomorrow night, technically tomorrow, it's my, uh, my 16th anniversary doing Word Balloon. And oh, uh, wow. well, isn't that crazy? Thank well, you very much. Tomorrow's my birthday. Hey, happy birthday. Hey, that's wonderful. Thank very you. nice. <laughs> wow. So, um, I, uh, I'm going to actually show, uh, Tom King, the bat, the former Batman writer and currently writing, Adam Strange and the Batman Catwoman book, among other books. He's about to start Supergirl. He's going to interview me, which is very nice. But I figured I would uh, get out some of my commission art, uh, some of the stuff you can see in frames on the walls and stuff, and I'll take photos of those, but also a lot of loose art that I haven't no. had the chance to uh, to frame yet. And, oh, God, I mean, really, I really have to get on. And I've got frames sitting waiting to be filled. And, I mean, my, I'm going to be like Oscar Madison and just have, like, you know, Tons of tons of comic book art on all on all the walls and stuff, and I really love it because when 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 friends come over and they they first see them and stuff, they are really like impressed, and it's like, oh, this is like really like great art, and it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really is, yeah. So we're very fortunate that we're aware of it, and it's great to share it with people that way. So yeah. I'm looking forward to doing that tomorrow night. But Nikki, again, uh, Wednesday night, yeah, uh, comicsplex.com, women in comics dot comicsplex.com. All you have to do is uh, register there and you'll be able to watch the event. And that's great. Um, I think it, I, I'm so glad that uh, you're involved with this. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you, you, th you know, it, it was, was this your idea, this panel? Um, kind of. Yeah. Um, they wanted me to do a women in comics and it just kind of came together. And uh, with Lily, it just seemed logical to do it this way. And like I said, I'd like to do some further things with women from the 70s, the underground comics, a whole panel on Wonder Woman. You know, there's lots to do. Oh, my God, yes. And, you know, uh, I don't and I don't remember if we talked about this in our first conversation, but I'd love to know more about Dorothy Woolfolk, uh, the romance editor. At, um, I believe I'm saying her name right. Maybe I'm not. But the romance editor at DC? Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm okay. Not sure. That's something and, I don't know. And, and a woman that I got to meet uh, at a couple East Coast conventions is Barbara Freelander. And Barbara was an associate editor at DC on the romance comics in the 60s. Yeah. And it was really great because there were, there were great artists like J. Scott Pike who didn't want to do superheroes. And he primarily worked for the romance end of DC Comics. 
And you know, as you I'm sure know, John Romita Sr. did amazing oh, yeah. romance comics. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, I mean, you know, have you ever talked to Jackie Nodell? No, is that uh is that Martin's daughter? A granddaughter. Granddaughter, okay, wow. Yeah, she's, I got to go she's, ahead. She's very knowledgeable about the romance a comic. Oh, that'd be cool. You, you should talk to her. She's, oh, I'd love that. She's fabulous. And that's her area of interest and her area of study. And uh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to talk to her because yeah, I, yeah. I did get to meet Marty a lot. Mar Marty, for years uh, after comics, he went to work for one of the big advertising agencies here in Chicago, Leo Burnett. So he had roots here. And... Um, he and uh, and I believe his wife was Jackie as well. Or I can't remember. No, I, I, I can't remember her name. Shame on me. Uh, because they were adorable together. Yeah. And then sadly, well, she. Well, Danny, either Danny or I can put you in touch with her. Oh, that'd be great. Thank yeah. you. Because, yeah, yeah I mean, it, I try to get Marty on, you know, to even do a quick floor interview at a con. And after his wife died, he's like, you know, I really appreciate it. And he was so sweet about it. But he's like, my heart's just not in it anymore. He goes, you know, I do the sketches, and is is either his kids were there, or maybe it was, uh, maybe it was Jackie. I don't know, but it was really sweet that you know. I was so glad that he was there the years that he was, and I I got a few. I got a quick Alan Scott Green Lantern that's you know five by eight or whatever, and then also a couple of prints that he made of uh, Golden Age characters that he would draw. Great stuff, man. Now he was he was incredible, and and another he's one of those guys, much like the major that. You know, people know the Bill Finger story with Batman. And thankfully, in the last 15 years or so, they've become more aware of Finger's contributions to the Batman character, Jerry Robinson as well. So it's really important. And that's why it's great that you're doing this panel focusing on the women of the Golden Age that absolutely de deserve more attention and appreciation for what they did. Yep. It's one part of a big picture. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, everybody, go to uh, the Majors website I'll, I'll throw that back up again Not books. <laughs> right major malcolm uh, wheeler uh, nicholson.com and uh yeah man order some uh books from uh from nikki and i'm sorry i'm just trying to i want to get the uh, cover once again there it is dc comics before superman that's the first book and more to come uh i can't wait to talk to you about uh what you're doing with aces weekly so that'll be great yeah yeah it's gonna be fun Absolutely. Well, good luck on Wednesday. And as always, I appreciate you talking to me tonight. Great to talk to you, John. We could go on forever. <laughs> no problem. It's all good. And, and I'm glad that we've, we spent the time that we did. Are you really quickly, are you doing any live event? Have you planned on any live events for this year? Or are you still kind of waiting? I, to see? I, you know, I'm of the age that it's a little, I, I'm going to wait till things settle down. I understand. Did you get, are you fully, have you had your vaccine? Have you had oh, your shots yeah, yet, yeah, Nikki? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got mine too. In fact, <laughs> Thursday is my, uh, the grace period's over and I can, you know, God, I cannot wait to get to a pool because I'm a beach ball right now. I need to, I need to drop some pounds. I got a title fight coming up. I got to get in shape. So. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. So everybody, thanks a lot for watching tonight. Uh, Thank Tom you. King, absolutely. Thank you Tom, so much. Tom King, same time. Uh, oh no, actually, I guess we'll start nine o'clock central, ten o'clock Eastern tomorrow with Tom King. I hope you'll watch. Stay safe. 